welcome everyone to uh, the Editor's Select Seminar Series for the Society of Marine Mammalogy. Uh, my name is Daryl Bonas, and I'm <clears throat> the Editor-in-Chief of Marine Mammal Science. Our presentations in this seminar series um, arise from uh, papers published in the journal Marine Mammal Science. Um, and we have a board of editors that um, make recommendations and our, our presentations are chosen from those recommendations. So um, uh, a couple of practical matters you probably uh, know already when you join that uh, the session's being recorded. It'll be available um, on uh, the Society's YouTube uh, site uh, afterwards. Uh, may take a day or two to uh, be available, but it will be posted. Um, the question should be put in question and answers rather than in chat. Um, the paper uh, upon which tonight's presentation is based is available um, to all, whether you're a member of the society or have a subscription or not, um, until the end of this month. So with that, let me uh, introduce the uh, talk tonight and the speaker. Tonight's presentation is not on killer whales, as the last three have been, but it's on another odontocete species, uh, the Cook Inlet Beluga. Uh, Cook Inlet Beluga is a population that is listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act as a, an endangered distinct population segment. Um, to, to indicate the extent to which the species is at risk, the National Marine Fisheries Service actually includes it as one of nine species most at risk in their species in the spotlight um, program. And this is in that program because of its uh, declining status, um, the failure to recover after what was thought to be the primary cause of their decline, that is indigenous hunting, but subsequently, after many years of no hunting, uh, the population still uh, has not recovered and is not doing well. So tonight's talk will focus on data from photo ID'd animals and stranded animals over a 13-year period um, to help shed some light on what the causes of mortality might be. Um, as you can see, I think, on your screen, the title of the talk, uh, there are multiple authors on this, so I will only introduce the uh, lead author and the presenter of tonight's talk, Dr. Tamara McGuire. Tamara has led the research team, and she also led the endangered species recovery team for the Cook Inlet Beluga. Um, Tamara received her undergraduate degree in marine biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, she obtained her master's and PhD in wildlife and fisheries from uh, both from Texas A&M University. And um, in exchanging uh, to learn a little bit about Tamara's background, she mentioned to me that she's the first in her family to obtain a PhD. But she also noted that she comes from a matriline of determined women. Um, and in fact, an interesting note that I really felt compelled I had to uh, mention here is um, she probably has a claim that not many people, if in fact any do, that uh, her mother and grandmother have a research vessel named after them. Uh, Tamara also gave me um, a, a little bit of a clue to her age uh, class when she reminisced about her first science talk being prepared with colored markers and transparencies. Um, for full disclosure, I should note that like Tamara, I periodically reminisced about some of the previous methods for preparing scientific papers and talks. In fact, as uh, I mentioned to Tamara uh, a little while ago, my PhD was done on a typewriter and analyses done on main so uh, with that, I think we'll stop reminiscing and let's hear from Tamara and uh, what she has to tell us about Cook Inlet Belugas. Tamara, go ahead. 
Okay, thank you very much, Daryl. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the student members at large team um, for inviting my co-authors and I to present today for all the work they did behind the scenes to make this happen. Uh, it's a real honor to speak to this group, um, although it is a bit strange to be talking to a computer screen. Um, I hope I don't mess up the screens. Um, I'm hoping someone will buzz me and let me know if I do. Um, I've been a member of the Society for Marine Mammalogy since 1993. And if you uh, track the years of the journal on my shelves, it's like reading tree rings. And they'll tell you the tale of drought and flood in, uh, uh, over the last three decades. Let's see, nothing's happening here. There we go. I'm, I'm lucky to be part of a broader research team who came together to collaborate on this paper that I'm going to present today. We represent a lot of different areas of expertise and perspectives. Some folks on the team have worked together for over two decades. So going by rows, we have Kim Sheldon, Gina Himes Bohr, Amber Stevens, John McClung, Chris Gardner, Carolyn Gertz, Kathleen Burek Huntington, Greg O'Quarry Crow, and Bruce Wright with his shark friend. We represent many different or institutions and organizations. This work would not have been possible without the Knick tribe's invitation to collaborate and for their support of this paper. I'd like to pause here for a minute to have a welcome by Richard Porter, who's the CEO of the Knick tribe. Dali Ashlinda Shishida, Richard Porter. Welcome to the Marine Mammal Conference today. My name is Richard Porter. I'm CEO of Knick tribe, as I've been able and had the opportunity to serve <laughs> for the last 15 years. The Kinnick Tribe is located up here in the Cook Inlet area, in the upper Cook Inlet area. Uh, they've been here for thousands of years and been stewards of the ecosystem for that time and since time immemorial. The beluga whales and the project that you're about to see and witness as, as part of the presentation have been a huge part of Denina life up here in the Cook Inlet area. We've depended on the beluga as part as part of our dietary system along with the salmon and all the other all the other creatures of this area we look at the beluga as a canary of the ecosystem and the project that you're about to see the photo id project is a great opportunity uh, that you will see from tamara mcguire and bruce wright as the researchers on the project I hope that you guys enjoy the project and get great information and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. So here's an overview of today's talk. I'm happy to take questions at the end and I'd like to start by giving priority to questions from students. When I was a student, I was way too shy to ask questions out loud. And looking back, that's, um, I wish I had not done that. Um, so beluga whales are found in the Arctic and the subarctic. They're dark when they're born and they lighten with age. Worldwide, a lot of people like the beluga whales for a lot of different reasons. Although not everybody is a fan. Of the five populations of belugas that are found in Alaska, only one is found in Cook Inlet. The stock is considered as a distinct population segment due to the geographic and genetic isolation. This designation means it's not only distinct, but it's also significant to the species. It is listed as an endangered species and its current numbers are only a few hundred. Although hunting ceased over a decade ago, the population is still not recovering and no one knows exactly why. The most recent population estimate is from 2018 and was about 280 belugas. I'd like to pause for just a second and show you what that looks like. 
So each of the square, uh, squares on the screen is a beluga tail and represents one individual. It's pretty sad when they can all fit on one slide. When the belugas, and from here on in, uh, when I say beluga, I'll be referring to Cook Inlet belugas, were listed as endangered. As Daryl mentioned, overhunting was listed as the main cause of decline. However, the last successful hunt was in 2005, and the population is still not recovered. The recovery team met between 2010 and 2013 and looked more closely at the situation and helped draft a recovery plan. The recovery plan has a list of possible threats listed here, but cannot point to any single reason or a smoking gun. It concluded that the cumulative, that multiple stressors and their cumulative and the synergistic effects are the most likely culprits in the lack of recovery. And I think these are the hardest to address. Most of the research to date is focused on population numbers, estimations, and trends using a variety of methods. Cook Inlet is not an easy place to work, and the work can be dangerous and painstaking. So by acknowledging the data gaps and constraints in each of the methods that I'll be talking about, this is in no way disparaging the various research teams or our results. A recent paper by Aaron Jacobson and colleagues combined data from aerial surveys, photo ID, and hunting. It found that recent population growth is less than would be needed for recovery and that there may be problems in particular with the juvenile and adult age class. The model did not specifically include mortality of identified individuals or stranding data. The paper we're presenting today looked more closely at mortality by combining the stranding data with the photo ID data. We were curious about any demographic or geographic patterns and also wanted to compare the known mortality rates to the estimates. That makes it sound like we all had it planned out and it was very logical and stepwise with the research going on, but it actually wasn't. And that's the story I wanna talk about for the rest of the talk. In the uh, ID project, the Cook Inlet Beluga Well Photo ID project, we strive to learn more about the population and the lack of recovery by first learning about the individuals in it and then building out to the level of the population. Our study began in 2005 and it takes place in the upper part of Cook Inlet. Uh, we're based in Anchorage and in the heart of the summer range of the belugas. The photo ID work, uh, the surveys are conducted from small boats and from shore. Up to now, we have encountered and photographed over 600 whale groups. We collect two types of data. One is the survey data on the groups and the other is about the individuals. With the groups, we see distinct patterns of distribution according to the location, season, and tidal stage. Here's a map that shows all of the groups we have encountered in the 13 year time period that's covered in this paper. You'll see that the groups are usually in clumps at river mouths or harder to see on this map, they're traveling in the channels connecting the river mouths. The second type of data we collect is information on in, uh, uh, individuals. For example, the whale in this picture was seen in 2005 and again two years later, and it's identified by faint white marks on the right side of the whale. So the head would be over here and the tail would be over here in both of these images. So even though the marks are faint and hard to see, they persist over time. This is what we use to build our long term catalog. We have a catalog of right sides, of left sides, and one called the dual side in which we can see marks that link both sides, the two sides. We obtain our photos of live and dead whales from a variety of sources, and we're grateful to all the folks who share their sightings and their photos with us. Our project's involved in outreach as well, and we have a website uh, that tells about the project. Um, we share our reports and it provides a way for people to share their sightings and, and the pictures they take with us for us to try to ID the whales. 
Right now, I'd like to give a special shout out today to the folks on the joint base Elmendorf Richardson crew who are out there today on the snowy icy banks by Eagle Bay. They're watching for whales and they said they would be listening to talk on their phone, which is also probably a good way to scare away the bears. Um, but I just wanted to say hello to them and they are literally walking the talk of conservation science. In addition to the dates and location and group information associated with the photos of the identified individual belugas, whenever possible, we try to, we try to include in our catalog any biological information that's available. So the sex of the individuals, the age, the reproductive status of the females. This information comes from necropsies, previous satellite tagging studies, and remote biopsy. Here's an example of an individual, D103, who's been identified in every year of her study. Uh, we recognize her from her left side, from her right side, and from both sides. We picked this one for this presentation because her marks are very easy to see on the, on the screen. Her main marks are scars left by satellite tags that were affixed to her in 2001. And I can confidently say it's a her because of the biopsy samples that were taken uh, at the time of capture and the DNA analysis that uh, revealed that she's a female. So thanks to Greg or Corey Crow for that. Um, we were able to use her tag marks, but also her natural marks to recognize her again and again as a whale in the catalog. And we follow her movements around the inlet um, throughout the years. And we also note her uh, when she has a calf with her and the relative age of the calf. This is the type of work that we do with all of the whales in the catalog. As important as it is to look at births, it's also really important to look at deaths. We compared all of the photos of dead whales that we receive or that we take to individuals in our catalog to try to make a match. During the time period of this paper, 2005 through 2017, we were able to identify 12 dead stranded whales by their marks, although there were many more than this that stranded. Stranded whales are especially valuable to identify because they can usually tell us the sex of the animal, the reproductive status, and sometimes the age and cause of death. In return, matching them to photo ID records, um, we can provide some context about the identified individual. So where it has been seen previously, if it had been photographed with the calf, if we, doc if we had documented any signs of trauma, if it had been a previous live stranding, if it had been involved in research, uh, such as satellite tagging or biopsy or photo ID. In the process of looking at the information on these 12 dead whales, we noticed some surprising patterns and wondered if they were artifacts of our photo ID methods or if they were truly occurring in the population. And if so, could they offer any clues about the population's lack of recovery? So some of the things that stood out to me in those 12 that uh, were matched is that the, they were reproductive age adults um, so they're, um, I might have expected more of a U-shaped curve, so very young and much older. Another surprise was the number of the dead uh, of the females was about the same as the number of dead males. If we look at what had been recently going on in the St. Lawrence estuary population in Canada, they had seen a peak in the um, number of dead reproductive of, of, of the females when they were postpartum um, and their calves and they were able to to link it to labor and postpartum complications from endocrine disruption and environmental contaminants. Um, but that's not what we saw in this general pattern. The animals that had tooth ages on them, none of them were very old. They were adults, but they weren't adults in their older decades, even though the lifespan of the species in general is up until the, their 70s. We were only getting uh, whales during the months of the year without ice, so pretty much from May to November. Um, 
which on the one hand you might expect because that's when they're most likely to be encountered by people who are out and about. On the other hand, winters in Alaska are really harsh in Cook Inlet and you would expect between the winter storms and the lack of um, the salmon runs and hooligan runs during that time, that might be a pretty tough time of year if you're a whale and there would be more strandings. And there was no clear pattern of cause of death. There was no smoking gun that jumped out of, oh, this is why they're dying and this is why they might not be recovered. But there were a couple of things to consider about the methods that we were using. One, we don't usually identify individuals in the catalog until they're about five years old and have their permanent marks. We can track very young calves by proxy with their moms, but we begin to lose them about two years old um, in terms of being able to track them as individuals. And so it's not surprising that in the photo ID of the dead stranded whales, they were older whales. Um, so it just left me with more questions. Are these patterns that we're seeing really what's going on with the stranding, stranded animal, dead stranded animals in general, or is just the pattern we're going to see in the photo ID catalog because it's the nature of our photo, photo ID catalog. So that was the main question. Were the same patterns occurring in the larger stranding data set without the bias of the photo ID data set? That seems like a really easy, basic question to answer, but it wasn't. We had a lot of difficulty obtaining data on the 95 belugas that had stranded between 2005 and 2017. The recovery plan did have a list of the number of dead per year for some of these years, um, but it didn't have their sex or age class or cause of death. And when we started to work with different offices and teams and groups uh, to get at that information, we realized that the total numbers and the different databases had a lot of discrepancies between them. So we were helped by a lot of different folks with the various offices of NOAA and with the Stranding Network. And um, we all worked really hard to compare and compile data and, and try to get at what those numbers were and as much information as possible. So what happened next is kind of the rest of the story that I'm telling today. We reviewed the Stranding information uh, data for information that was obtained in the field and then also in some cases in the laboratory. And that either came from examination of entire carcasses or from tissues. In a few cases, the age of the animal and the age, uh, sex and the age class of the animal could be determined from carcasses where there was a picture of the whale taken by members of the public but they weren't necessarily examined in person by the stranding network. So we included those whenever possible. So here's a summary of, of what we found. Between 2005 and 2017, as I said before, there were 25 dead beluga whales that were reported to NOAA. Most of the reported carcasses were adults or they were in this category that we had to make that straddled uh, the category between the sub-adult category and the adult category because it was unclear either from the level A or from the length or additional information. And so this was, this, how, this was usually animals that would have been in the about 10 year old range. I'll refer you to the paper for the more specific definition of age classes that we used and why. If we look at the sex of the 95 uh, dead whales, about half of, the, of them were of unknown sex, either uh, advanced decomposition or they were not examined. And the remaining half was split in between the males and the females. So that is the same pattern we saw as with the photo ID animals. Um, slightly under half of the reported dead had pictures of the carcasses and about 13% uh, of those we were able to match to the catalog. Um, so we, we knew who those individuals were and in return we could enter their data into the catalog. In addition, about a third of the reported of dead were, were examined 
either during necropsy or they had some tissues taken to um, have their pathology looked at later. And a few of these were assigned cause of death. So that didn't give us a lot of insight in that uh, data set in the cause of death. So to try to understand more about cause of death, we turned to a paper by Kathy Burick Huntington and her colleagues where they reviewed the mortality of stranded whales between 1998 and 2013. Here they found that live stranding was the most commonly assigned cause of death if you combined the single animal strandings with the mass strandings. Um, but still, the majority of mortalities were of unknown cause. Uh, we would love to see a similar retrospective analysis done of the more recent data. So despite all the hard work of the stranding responders, slightly less than half the reported dead are examined annually. This is due to a variety of really challenging conditions. Um, right now, though, I would like to just take a moment and acknowledge the work of the Alaska Marine Mammal Stranding Network and other networks worldwide right now who have somehow managed to keep stranding response going during the last two years during a pandemic. You really are heroes for being able to do that. So we had initially tried to get at the number of dead that are unreported by looking at the sighting gaps in the photo ID catalog. So what's the maximum amount of time that went by in between the sightings of an individual and anything beyond that, we would assume a whale was dead. Um, and so we were gonna try to get at number of unreported strandings. Um, this is where I had, it's a good thing I have co-authors because I really tried to shoehorn this one in and make it work. Um, but we knew this would still be an underestimate in part because when we went back and looked at the, no, the records of the known dead, we saw that most of them were in fact, uh, we were able to photograph them as live whales in the very year they had died or the previous year. So there would still, this would still be a big underestimate. Plus there are a lot of factors that go into the probability that we recite an animal, our effort where we looked, the types of marks that well had. Um, luckily, the photo ID data are being used in a bunch of different models with a bunch of different modeling teams to try to estimate, estimate vital rates. And we could use their estimates instead of, of survival and mortality rather than trying to essentially do the same thing within the catalog with a million caveats. Um, so we could look at their estimates that took into account the variability and the survey effort and the identification rates that are inherent in our catalog and methods. So when we look at just the reported number of dead, it comes to about 2% annually of the entire estimated population. But when we look at what the models are, are predicting in terms of um, the death rates of whales, the, the survival of whales, the actual number of dead per year is about three times this. Um, so the actual is about three times the reported. So this is what that looks like. The red X's are the average number of reported whales compared to the population estimate from 2018, which is the most recent one of 280 whales. But now the yellow X's are the number of estimated dead belugas in addition to the number of reported carcasses in red. And those are relative to the total population. So you see that's a pretty big chunk of the screen. So we were curious about the spatial and the temporal patterns of reported carcasses to see what they might be telling us as well. One thing we knew and that were backed up by the data that we got, um, we, were, we looked at it was the live strandings are more likely to happen, but also to be detected in the shallow areas of the arms near Anchorage where there are shallow waters and extreme high tides and low tides and tidal currents. 
when we look at the seasonal pattern, there might be a seasonal pattern with peaks in the, in the summer and early fall that might be related to prey or storms or algal blooms, but that's just speculation at this point. And both of these patterns are overshadowed by, are overshadowed by how many carcasses are not detected or examined. So mostly these patterns are telling us right now that belugas are reported stranding along the road systems or common flight paths. And during the months when the daylight and the weather that mean, mean that more people are out and about. So either driving along the highway system that's just part of the inlet, coincidentally where most of the strandings are, or boating on or flying over or hiking or off-roading on the shores of Cook Inlet. So this study raised a lot of questions. Why is the mortality of the, of the adults this high? Is there truly a, a dominant cause of death? And if so, what is it? What could be learned from, from studying the winter strandings if they occur? And how, would, how could we even go about it? One question I was fascinated by was where are the very old adults? Were they all hunted in previous decades? Are they dying now in places and times of year where they're not being detected? Were they ever even in this population or is this a, a population on the edge of the range of the species that has always lived in an extreme environment that's recently gotten more challenging? When we look at the results of the tooth aging that was done on the carcasses, I think it's very interesting. The age estimates from the model were also interesting. They all indicate that, an absence, that there's an absence of very old animals and that the whales are dying in the reproductive primes. Two of our co-authors, Kim Sheldon and Greg O'Corey Crow, just completed a report with colleagues where they examined hunting from 1987 to 2005 and have found that the numbers that were hunted were actually much higher than previously thought and reported. Both sexes were taken and that the age range of hunted animals was between calves to adults in their reproductive primes. But again, no older adults, this time not beyond their third decade. So this to me raises even more questions about current demographics of the population and its ability to recover. I think if we have any hope, hope of understanding population recovery and contributing to it, we're gonna to need to understand and reduce the amount of uncertainty involved in understanding mortality. We need to increase the number reported, the number we photograph and examine and decrease the uncertainty about age, sex and cause of death. My co-authors and I have a detailed list of recommendations in the supplementary materials of the paper. None of them are, are new. They've all been brought up by previous teams and groups and papers, but we thought it was worth repeating and worth amplifying the, the message. So I'll try to summarize it here. We have a lot of suggestions for increasing the detection, reporting, and response of of stranded, animal, of stranded beluga whales. We also have some suggestions for standardizing the data collection and reducing the uncertainty in the data that are collected. I would like to highlight the good news that a proportion of the carcasses with the photographs that um, has increased a lot in recent years. And we're really thankful for that. We also advocate for the increase of examinations done in laboratory conditions. So out of the time constraints and dangerous conditions in the field. We also recommend a health assessment of individuals in the photo ID catalog. We've already begun a bit of this work with looking at the signs of trauma of animals in the photo ID catalog. Our team recently published a paper where we looked at signs of human caused trauma and stranded whales and an identified whales in the dual side catalog of the photo ID catalog. We found about a third of the individuals examined bore signs of human caused trauma with entanglement being the single highest cause and vessel strikes the next largest. 
I'd like to continue this analysis for the right and left side catalogs as well. We recommend a single commonly accessible stranding database, ideally managed by one person who has re ultimate responsibility for quality control and updates. And lastly, we encourage continued coordination and feedback among all of the different research groups. We realize it's really, it's one thing to say collaboration is important and it's quite another to be patient with all the extra work and the social dynamics involved of collaborative studies. Um, here are some examples of collaborative efforts that are helping to learn more about recovery and mortality. They involve sharing biological data, citing information, the photos, photos taken with new techniques and perspectives, and sharing data with various modeling efforts for estimates of population rates and viability. A recent example is the work led by Gina Himes Bohr, who used our photo ID data to estimate rates of reproduction and survival. As with the carcass data, carcass data is looking like low survival in adults and subadults is a problem for this population as are low reproductive rates. Other models are using these estimates to build integrated population models, analyze population viability, and look at the population consequences of disturbance. My co-authors and I will be presenting a poster at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium in January and a talk at the Society for Marine Mammalogy meeting that is rescheduled in August um, that is a synthesis of what we're learning about life history patterns from the photo ID data, reproduction data, and stranding data. Overall, it appears that the combination of a somewhat delayed age of first reproduction, a longer than average inner birth interval, and an early death are all combining to lead to a shortened reproductive lifespan. Now that we have a better sense of these patterns, the causal mechanisms though have to still be identified and the list of suspects remains quite large and quite complicated. I'd like to sincerely thank all of the collaborators and the funders who have supported our work through the years. And I'd like to thank our many colleagues past and present for sharing data, expertise and their perspectives as well as the Knick Tribe, the Society for Marine Mammalogy, and the journal Marine Mammal Science for the opportunity to share this work. Um, okay, it's, I'm still talking to the screen, so if anyone's still there, I'd be glad to um, take questions now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tamara, for an interesting um, presentation. Um, in some ways, I think as you summarized, uh, you raise perhaps more questions than you actually answer from your paper. Um, but that's what science is, in, at least in part, about. So um, I appreciate the presentation. And we'll open it up. Uh, we have a few questions in the uh, Q&A. And uh, um, Eric, I guess you're going to monitor and run the uh, question and answer session. Sure thing. I can start with the first question here. Um, this one, and thank you so much, uh, Tamara, for the wonderful talk. Um, this one's from Rebecca Boyce. Have you been able to examine any movement patterns through the photo ID? Could these suggest some animals are leaving the area, and that is why dead stranded individuals are younger than you would expect? The patterns that we've seen with the photo ID are that animals are staying within the inlet and um, but you know it's we're back to the question of we're limited by our methodology we don't leave the inlet to do photo ID now when when folks are elsewhere we have had some photos shared actually by the Tacoma whale that people may have heard about recently, the beluga whale that turned up in Tacoma um, and in Puget Sound. And so we, uh, there were folks that took some photos of that whale. 
we took a careful look at them and tried to match them with our catalog. Um, because that was a question, you know, was this a wayward whale that came from Cook Inlet? Well, we did the same with San Diego, uh, the San Diego beluga that turned up, I believe it was last year or the year before. So of the photos we've had shared with us from whales outside of Cook Inlet, um, we've also poured through the catalog of uh, the photo ID catalog, catalog of the Yakutat whales which are down the Gulf of, of Alaska from Cook Inlet to try to make any matches there. I mean, Greg already did the work with the genetics. And so we know that genetically, but you know, you never know in the meantime, if somebody went wandering down the coast. And so when we see the photos, we, um, from Eltor, we try to match them. But in terms of the whales we have in our catalog and where we look, we're seeing those same whales year after year um, and in the same area as the ones that are found in Upper Cook Inlet are the same ones that we photograph down in the middle inlet. Uh, so I don't know if that completely answers your question. I think it's a pretty good answer. Okay, so uh, next question here, uh, Mariana Chavez Andrade. Excellent talk. What do you think happened in 2007, 2008 2014 and 2017, where you got the highest number of beluga deaths. Do you think there was an oceanographic process that caused that mortality? I would love to know the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, we're working more with modelers um, who are bringing, especially the PVA model that Amanda Warlet is looking at, where she's bringing in more of the prey data, which has been very hard to come by, and more of the oceanographic data. So. We have questions. Um, that's why we're super excited to be working with the modeling teams because then we can turn to them and say, well, what about this? Did you think about this? And actually, you know, hope we can all find the data set to work into the model. So from photo ID, I, I can't answer that question. I could contribute the sighting data we have and help to feed it into models that can help to bring those data in to, to answer that. I do know that. Um, one of the papers, and I'm blanking on it right now, honestly, um, showed a break about 2010 in some of the population trajectories. And I know um, Paul Wade and his group have talked about this, and they think it um, is probably related to oceanographic conditions. I mean, at this point, I don't know how things could not be related to oceanographic conditions. Yeah, and I think there's so many populations suffering such similar kinds of difficult and inexplicable trends. It's hard to not see the relationships globally. And this kind of uh, leads into the last question here uh, from, again, from Mariana Chavez Andrade. Um, do you think those numbers of deaths have serious implications for the population size? I think so. And again, this is why I'm glad to be working with the modelers and have them in the population viability analysis because she can she can pull in the numbers that we're sharing, but they can look at the scenarios. Well, what if prey changes? What if um, there's more ship strike deaths? What if you know all the things we suspect or know are going on? They can kind of play with those values and see what that does to the trajectory of the population. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, it's all the questions we have in uh, on Zoom. I think on Facebook, I actually had one before. Daryl might have some here. Um, I, I was actually just curious, thinking of this now. I have, maybe it's something not obvious or difficult to compare, but I'm wondering, do, are there other species for which you're seeing, like are there other species that we see similar trends in the way in which the cook and let, um, you know, the, the way their age classes break down? Uh, is it something there's a precedent for in some other citations? Or is this something that there hasn't, you're, you don't see a lot of relationship with other populations or other species? Again, I wish I, that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer to it. Um, the adults, dying in the reproductive prime 
really caught my attention. Um, it makes me in both of the sexes, right? That was odd to me. So it wasn't, oh, they're, the females are dying in childbirth. Um, so it makes you wonder, okay, what could be affecting both, both sexes and that age class? And so, I mean, the list goes on and on and they all go back to those threats. Ship strikes could do it, entanglement could do it, lack of access to prey, prey quality, being disrupted by feeding, um, changing water temperatures. And so the pathogens have changed, um, contaminants in the system um, that are now coming out because of prey stress. I mean, I still, it doesn't help to narrow it down any. It helps to rule a few things out, but it, it, it didn't help to, to narrow it right down either. Well, thank you for the wonderful talk and the answers. And I'll leave it to, oh, wait, hold on. Sorry, there's uh, one more question that just popped in. Um, second, okay, so this is from Kelly Matthews. Do you have any data to show approximately how many calves are being born each year and surviving the first year versus how many whales are dying each year of natural causes or otherwise? Thanks. And hi, Kelly. I work with Kelly. <laughs> um, she's one of the great volunteers that submits their photos. So, so the model that Gina Himes Bohr is working on with the photo ID data will, will answer that. She's got a paper that's in review right now, so I don't want to spill the beans on the exact numbers, but that will be coming out very soon, I hope. Um, Gina has given a talk at the science symposium in Alaska last year, Kelly, if you want to check that out. Um, but so I don't want to give the exact numbers, but there is a problem with reproduction as well. So it's not only survival, but there's a problem with reproduction. And her model is able to break it down to young of the year and then with different age classes. And she also models all of the uncertainty with the age classes because we might have a photo of a calf next to a mom um, and we're certain it's not a young of the year, but with the turbid water, we might not be able to tell if it's a two-year-old, three-year-old or four-year-old. And so, so Gina's made this, these nice Bayesian models that account for all the uncertainty and the fact that we may be certain it's not a six-year-old and we're certain it's not a newborn, but beyond that, you know, it could be two, three or four. So she's built all that into her model and is still is, is able to look at the, the, the survival rates. But I, I'm not gonna give those numbers out because they might change slightly and they're not really mine to cite. But the work's being done, it's a good question. Excellent. And Kelly responded, excellent. And she's excited to learn more. <laughs> and great talk. And thank you also. And I think I'll leave it to Daryl now. Okay, so I have one question I have um, is to what extent sort of sub, some combination of sublethal impacts that over a long period of time might lead to um, mortality, but no sort of smoking gun is there when you do a necropsy. I, I think that's probably what most likely is going on. Um, you know, there are a few where they can assign, say, ship strike or entanglement, but but more often there might be pneumonia, but that's not cause of death, or lots of parasites, but not necessarily cause of death. Um, and even in things where they have cause of death, let's say uh, there was an animal that choked on a flounder. You have to wonder, like, they share an environment with flounder. They're not all choking on flounder. Is there something going on with the prey? It was more likely to take a risk on a riskier prey object with all of the live strandings. Are they taking more risk in riskier areas because there's something else going on in the environment? So, so yeah, I, I think in a lot of the, um, when we look at, at cause of death and what the vets are, are saying in their necropsy reports, there's a lot of different things going on and maybe no one particular cause of, of death, but there's a cumulative 
you know, they might be thin, they might have high parasite loads, uh, and they might have life stranded. So there, there could be a lot of different things going on at once. I would also like to learn more about the contaminant loads um, and what's what's going on there. And maybe they at levels that when the animals you know, when their prey is okay, their amount of prey is okay and they're well nourished, it's not an issue. But if they're, if they're thin and they're burning their blubber more, now it becomes a problem. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so our, our kind of a general question about how, uh, obviously the Arctic is changing rapidly and dramatically. Um, uh, how is that uh, both affecting um, what's happening to the animals, but also how is it affecting uh, your ability to, to sort of pursue further questions about what might be going on? Thank you. Um, so two part, um, as, as Eric had asked about just, and one of the other questions has been about the, um, you know, the, the global temperature, the, the sea temperature changes, and I think being related to prey changes. Um, that's definitely associated with changing temperatures. And I, I worry about influx of invasive species, uh, about a changing prey base. Um, pathogens, harmful, algal, I'm a worrier, so the, this list just gets bigger with global warming, harmful algal blooms, um, it's, it's pretty extensive. Um, in terms of our ability to study them, I, I, I really noticed that last year. Um, you know, it's something I'd read about with, with hunters farther north that they're taking a lot more risk with the changes in ice and changing conditions, having to go out farther to encounter the animals. We, we found this last year just for our photo ID work and, and talked to colleagues in the state that were looking at other species, but the weather was a lot more extreme last year. It was a lot more extreme and less predictable. And so going out in a small boat um, with winds that are suddenly too dangerous when they weren't predicted to be that way at all, and the patterns change. So all of our kind of hideouts that we have staked out, oh, if the wind comes out of the west, go hide here. If it comes out, those, those weren't happening anymore. So we ended up in a few situations, you know, despite 16 years of working out there um, where we were surprised and, and encountering local people out, the set netters as well, who got in a few situations that were pretty scary. And we saw some Coast Guard rescues going on as well. Um, the Coast Guard's not right there. They have to come from quite a ways. And so it really did um, change how we did research. It makes me worry about the future, but it, it made me think, okay, if, if we're ending up uh, having to look around more and expend more resources, say in, times of, in terms of our fuel and our staff time, um, and the return is not as great and we're taking more risk whether we intend to or not, it makes me think the same is likely going on with the whales. Um, and so it, it just put it in more personal terms, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, um, if I put my uh, different hat on for uh, my position with the Marine Mammal Commission back in 2016, we did a listening session in a number of uh, Alaska Native uh, communities. And um, one of the questions we wanted to hear um, answered was how climate change is impacting uh, subsistence hunting. And, um, you know, uh, one of the obvious is the, the reduction in, in sea ice, but um, one that was perhaps a little more surprising was uh, major changes in uh, intensity of wind and where the wind was coming from that was making uh, a lot of uh, hunting situations quite dangerous for them. So it's interesting to hear you uh, talk about uh, the, the wind as a problem for 
Yeah, yeah. It's a problem for our team in the boat. I think it was a problem for the aerial survey teams. Uh, days they could go up and nod and um, yeah, it's it's definitely a concern. Well, jump in here. We have two more questions in the Zoom that popped up after a lively conversation. So one from Amy Heitman. Um, what is the typical body condition of live animals in the catalog? Hi, Amy. <laughs> that is something we would like to look at more closely. Um, part of the problem is with the turbid water that we have, it's really hard to see a whole lot of the body. And so um, we can do obvious things, like if we see there's a, a peanut head indentation or a, a backbone sticking out, um, we can note that and, and we do, but that's really rare to see. Um, I think a lot of the impetus for the UAS work being done was to hopefully look at body condition as they do with animals in clearer water. And I think that's also proving challenging. I think they have slightly more to look at that way with the fat around the neck. But um, I think it's proving to be very challenging because not much of the body is um, visible. Another thing that I learned from working with the vets is that often uh, with the belugas, the importance of their fat, it, it's so important in terms of insulation that when their diet is poor, they're more likely to lose their muscle, their paxil muscle than they are their blubber. And so they'll hang on to their blubber as long as they can at the expense of muscle. And so um, a whale might still look, it won't look emaciated, but it could be in really poor body condition. So I think we're gonna find more about this from the stranded whales, the actual thickness of the blubber and the composition of the blubber. Um, so we're doing what we can with the catalog, but it's, it's got some real limitations with looking at body condition. Interesting answer and one more question from anonymous. Uh, could inbreeding be a cause of decline in the beluga population? A good question. I'm not a geneticist. Uh, Greg is. He, Greg O'Corey Crow is. Um, and he's been working on this population as has Kim Parsons. I know on the recovery team, Greg was on it and did look at inbreeding depression from a small population. And it's certainly a concern. It's not the major concern, at least not yet. Um, it definitely is a concern. Um, and again, like so many of these things, it's certainly not helping, but I don't think that was the, that wasn't one of the main issues we were looking at yet. I'm, I'm sure Greg would have a much better answer. Thank you. And I think that's all the questions. Hey, I, uh, maybe we'll ask one more question, a question that, um, was asked of the last three speakers, uh, all of whom were uh, very uh, were students, active students, or recently graduated students. Was so. What was the best and worst advice um, you might have received as a graduate student? And is there any advice you might give to any of the students who uh, uh, may well be listening into the presentation tonight? Thank you. Um, I would say the worst looking back <laughs> was um, I've been told by one professor who was not my major professor, but um, he could tell I read outside of science that I might read science, but he could tell I read outside of science because I used too many adjectives. And I should only read science and only limit myself to science. Um, I shouldn't read conservation journals. I shouldn't think about advocacy and I shouldn't love my study animal. Um, and at the time I took it to heart. Um, I absolutely don't agree with any of that now. <laughs> so um, I, I would say times have probably changed. And um, I think my own thinking for challenging things like that has changed as well. So I would say my best advice I've learned, I've received and maybe developed some myself is learn your strengths and weaknesses and be honest about them. 
um, try to improve on them, both your strengths and your weaknesses, but realize you can't do it all and surround yourself with people that are really good at what they do, that are, that are, that have the expertise that can work with people that are non-experts that are willing to explain it to you. Um, so work with folks who are smart and skilled and, and, and trustworthy and it, and it will only make you a better scientist and um, advocate. Um, I think the days of saying that um, we should only do science and stay out, out of conservation um, I would I would question if we have the luxury, if you can even call it that, of of maintaining that stance anymore. Um, I'd also say just you know, this has been fascinating work and the previous work I've done, but at times it can be really hard and challenging. And and if you don't at some level love what you do or why you're doing it either the animal or the place or the sense of curiosity, it's, you're gonna need that to get you through. Um, so that's my advice. Don't, don't be ashamed to love your animal or your environment. Use that as a way to keep you going. Great, thanks for that. And I agree with you wholeheartedly in terms of uh, uh, being involved in conservation. I, I think back to my early career, which was mainly focused at uh, addressing evolution, questions of evolution in uh, aspects of reproductive strategy in pinnipeds. And um, I realized later in my career, um, being part of actually a conservation biology department and ultimately heading that department, um, that if you did have that sort of luxury of pursuing whatever you wanted to um, yeah, actually, uh, I, in my mind, had a payback to uh, getting involved in conservation. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a given. And of course, nowadays, I think uh, most uh, younger and uh, recent PhDs are heavily involved in both uh, basic science and conservation related work. Um, so absolutely essential. Uh, well, I don't see any more questions coming up in the Q&A, so uh, we are just past seven o'clock. Uh, we've had an hour uh, here to listen to your presentation and uh, appreciate uh, the time taking questions. So I think with that, um, we'll maybe say once again, thank you for agreeing to uh, give one of our uh, uh, seminars for the Society for Marine Mammalogy. And uh, with that, I guess we'll uh, follow it to an end. Thank okay. you, Taylor. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.